Hello, everybody. Dr. Lonnie Stewart here from the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. Are you a physical therapy student about to start studying for the National Physical Therapy Examination? Or maybe you're a professor, a program director, or a clinical instructor who teaches DPT students preparing for the NPTE? Either way, we would recommend checking out our sponsor, NPTE Final Frontier, and the community they've built around preparing for and succeeding on the NPTE. That exam and the preparation that goes along with it can be long, tedious, difficult, and stress-inducing, but it doesn't have to be. NPTE Final Frontier has the tactics and resources to help address all of the usual barriers. They even have scholarships to help with NPTE study courses, FSBPT registration fees, and even research opportunities. And if that's not enough, they're even donating to the very first annual HET Podcast Scholarship to be awarded at the end of every year. Go to NPTEFF.com for all of the details and use code HET for 10% off all purchases. Links to both the NPTE Final Frontier and their scholarship options are available in the show notes. And now, let's get ready to learn. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. F. Scott Field, and I've got with us today two very special guests. Dr. Joe Tata and Dr. Ginger Garner, I actually have a question for both of you. Um, Ginger, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about your academic journey and how it's led you to where you are today. Well, first of all, thanks for having us on today. I really appreciate it. To give you the short story of how I got to be on this particular path, when I uh, graduated from PT school, I had, um, then at that time it was a master, so an MPT. I took a job at an underserved area in a little town off the coast of North Carolina uh, on the Outer Banks, and um, it was underserved, and I immediately started getting people that had been prescribed opioids. Turns out it was going to end up being um, one of the top, I think it was number three, the third most impacted county in the United States. Um, Here I am. I'm a baby PT, you know. (laughs) I think I have all these tools in my toolbox for what I'm doing. And um, I considered, you know, quitting in that first year because I thought this is this is not what I signed up for. I quickly realized that what I learned in PT school wasn't enough. I started to fall back on the yoga training that I had, which came before PT school. I was a licensed athletic trainer prior to that. So I had worked in the, you know, sports med field before that. And so I fell back to that training and started using, you know, yoga and large part, you know, mindfulness driven activities and it worked. Whereas what I was using in PT alone wasn't working. And so that was a real eye opener for me. And, um, you know, long story short, I started to try and seek out more training that was evidence based in yoga. And at that time, there wasn't, (laughs) there wasn't any, and there particularly wasn't any for healthcare providers. So I started writing and teaching, and that's kind of where I ended up is really focusing on the integrative pathway. And then over the, over the decades, um, lifestyle medicine came to be a, quite a defined term with six pillars. And so you know, that, that became the basis for um, everything that I was doing. It certainly became the basis of uh, the book that Joe and I co-edited. So that's the, that's the short story. Yeah, I personally, uh, I can relate because I went to an MPT program at East Carolina University. Uh, yeah. And yeah, my brother was an athletic trainer there as well. So he ended up becoming a nurse practitioner eventually, but we used to spend summers in Kitty Hawk there in the Outer Banks. So I know the area well, and it definitely it was an underserved area. The whole Outer Banks needed a lot more help. And, and luckily they're getting it little by little. I know East Carolina is sending a bunch of people out that way. So it's been nice to see that grow over the years. Um, Joe, how about you? Tell us a little bit about your academic journey and how it's led you to where you are today. Sure. I mean, I think some of the the story that Ginger has told is is similar to mine. Our stories complement each other, which is why they would complement each other so well with this book. Uh, You know, my story really is, so I go back just a tiny bit further. I graduated with a bachelor's degree in physical therapy, if people can remember back that far. And I really pretty much went right into private practice, running a, a large private practice in New York City. And after a couple of years of running kind of your traditional biomedical physical therapy practice, I was really frustrated with the limitations of that model. And I saw how these quick fix kind of magic bullet solutions um, really disempowered people with chronic pain 
and it didn't improve their quality of life. So kind of ginger segued into um, yoga. I actually started using Pilates really early in my career, primarily with treating dancers, but also using it with kind of your general ortho sports population. And then from there, I went back and pursued my uh, transitional DPT at a wonderful program at Arcadia University, where I still do some teaching. And in the health and wellness promotion class there, we had to do kind of a thesis paper. And, you know, it's physical therapy school, so everyone's doing things on exercise and movement and balance, and that's all wonderful. And um, Kirsten Palombero, who's my professor at the time, I said, you know, I have been deeply entrenched in nutrition. I'm starting to use it with my patients and clients, and I want to do a thesis paper on nutrition, which is what I did. I did a, you know, it was like a 20 page thesis paper. And at the time she's like, you know, this is really good. She's like, would you like to submit it to a couple of journals? So I said, sure. So PTJ, Journal of Orthopedic and Sports Physical Therapy. And I think the th third one we submitted to was maybe the Journal of Physical Therapy Education. And so this is back in uh, kind of early 2000s, so to speak, maybe a little bit later than that. And the replies were, I don't see a dietitian on this paper. I don't see a nutritionist. So the, the paper was titled The Impact of Nutrition on Musculoskeletal Pain, right? So something squarely within our scope of practice. And again, at that time came back like these, like, you know, why are you talking about this? What are you doing? You know, fast forward now to 2022, and this is all over our literature. Um, it's all over the, the book that Ginger and I edited together. Almost every chapter, I think every chapter actually does talk about nutrition, um, both with general health as well as the specialties. But that's just a little bit of my story on how um, I arrived at the place where I am. Yeah, I mean, I think we hear the cliche phrases all the time, movement is medicine, right? But we also have to look at food as fuel, right? We need to look at how we're fueling the body and how food can really be used as, as medicine too. And nutrition is an important part of, of a health and lifestyle, right? So let's start at the very beginning here. Let's start with integrative and lifestyle medicine. What is it? Tell us the definition. Give us an, a brief outline of that. Well, I'll kick it off and Joe, you can chime in. Um... It really encompasses two segments, although they, they can't really be teased apart because inside of lifestyle medicine and to a large part uh, degree functional medicine as well, it's all about changing people's lifestyle habits and choices to optimize them, to prevent non-communicable chronic diseases and, and to mitigate and mediate and prevent you know, uh, issues with pain. So in lifestyle medicine, we have pillars of physical activity which is a given, sleep, uh, nutrition, stress management, environmental influences, um, as well as you know, interpersonal and interpersonal relationships. And then on the other side of that, we have integrative medicine, which inside integrative medicine also includes all of those, those lifestyle factors. But in integrative medicine, um, you can segment those categories out into mindfulness-based uh, activities and movement which really encompass a large span. It's, it's Pilates. I did Pilates training earlier on, early on too. Um, it's Tai Chi. It's so many different things. Um, it includes nutrition. It includes, for some practitioners, depending on their personal scope of practice, supplementation and, and looking at um, changes in, in um, what they may uh, take as far as nutraceuticals as well. Again, depending on their personal, uh, what, what's in their personal scope. And other modalities that would fall under the uh, National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health in that way. So that's kind of an overview of integrative and lifestyle medicine coming together. But there's such an intersectionality, you can't really tease them apart. I have another question then to follow up on that. Joe, you mentioned that this is kind of within our scope of practice and we should have been talking about it anyway. Now it looks like we finally are getting that opportunity. You know, tell us a little bit about that. Like, how does all of this fit into the, the physical therapy scope of practice and, and what should we be doing about it? So when you, you know, when I listen to Ginger uh, explain what lifestyle and integrative medicine is, it really fits under kind of that broader um, umbrella of a biopsychosocial model. And that's the model from which all of us are uh, approaching patients. Um, with that, obviously, there are biological, psychological, and social components. So you can hear all of that in, in kind of our, our conversation already. So, you know, we learn that theory in school and obviously we're expected to take that theory and apply it to practice. Um, then 
we have kind of these House of Delegate statements, right? These are um, position statements that the American Physical Therapy sends out that helps inform what we do as professionals. It also helps inform our scope of practice. And there are numerous House of Delegate statements around things like nutrition, um, health and wellness promotion, a physical therapist's role in primary care, a physical therapist's role in mental and behavioral health, a phys physical therapist's role in, in using complementary and integrative approaches. All those are part of our House of Delegate statement. So they're, they're well within, squarely within our scope of practice. And, you know, if you're looking at your, um, your state association or your state guidelines, all that really fits under health and wellness promotion. There's a, probably another piece I, I want to add to that. We've talked about a lot of terms so far, things like complementary and integrative, and we're talking about psychosocial approaches and, and yoga. And when people hear the words like complementary, integrative, functional, I think there's a crew of people that are like, yes, we have to go in this direction. Like we can't have a sick care system anymore. We have to adopt these other approaches. And then there's a group who are like, well, I don't know, like, where's the research behind this? And you know, can we do this, right? So the skeptics, for the skeptics out there, uh, I just want to kind of raise awareness around uh, two points. The first is the NIH HEAL initiative, which stands for um, helping addiction or helping long-term addiction problems. Um, that is an NIH well-funded um, number of studies now that are looking at pain and addiction specifically using integrative approaches. And then just recently, if you're following things on the news, the White House has started to um, invest in lifestyle medicine specifically and educating people in lifestyle medicine. So this is no longer um, new research. This is no longer, you know, kind of fringe. This is what we are all probably going to be expected to do, if not now, definitely within the next year plus. Right. So that is a perfect lead into my next question here. Where do you guys see this going now? Where, where do you see physical therapists fitting into this and model and, and moving it forward? Ginger, let's start with you. Ladies first. <laughs> well, I think for Joe and myself, I mean, we've been practicing this for so long. It's kind of organic for us. Um, I think when I'm talking to other people about it, I want to know what struggles they perceive they're going to have. What barriers do they perceive they're going to have? Do they work in a large hospital setting? Do they work in a small rural setting where maybe, you know, their supervisor hasn't even heard of lifestyle medicine or um, they live in a small region of the South where maybe yoga is misconstrued with religion? Like, what are their, what are the pushbacks they're going to get? Um, are they talking about starting something? Because many, many hospitals now, they want something that's complementary. They want something that's integrative. It is, you know, it's a moneymaker in some settings or whatnot, but they want to know, you know, what they're able to include, what they aren't able to include. Maybe the hospital system wants to know, is this, is this, is including health promotion um, and ILM going to be reven revenue generating? Or is it going to be revenue neutral? Like those are the the big sticky questions that then I would, you know, talk to the therapist as, you know, and I'm teaching, I speak at several different, you know, uh, programs or when I'm teaching continuing education, I have therapists go through a SWOT analysis, you know, and, and ask those questions. And then I work through them on a case by case basis, because for me early on, I mean, when I was practicing this, sure. I mean, I would get some pushback and you kind of felt homeless because yoga didn't fit into, you know, an APTA definition of movement. And yet you go over to the yoga community and they're like, well, why do you why is physical therapy important? Because yoga fixes everything, which it doesn't. <laughs> you know. So you kind of felt uh, like uh, like you were homeless. But um, I would ask those questions to start because it seems so natural to what we do. And, you know, we we have kind of tackled those barriers in the practices. I own a private practice here in Greensboro, North Carolina, for example. And so when people come to me, they already know I'm doing it. It's it's in the name. So I'm not getting pushback. There are no boundaries. They're coming to me because of that. But that doesn't mean that other people aren't, you know, coming up against those. So I, I would say it's hard to answer because it's a case by case basis. But the way I approach students and the therapist that I train is by looking at that SWOT analysis and then asking, what are the big wicked questions that your system or your supervisor is going to bring to you? Let's tackle them one at a time. Yeah, I love that. Now, you know, thank you for creating the roof over those people's heads and, and the home, if you will, for this stuff, because 
if if it's not there, you've got to pave your own way, you know, and you guys are, are definitely pioneers for that. So thank you for that. Uh, Joe, how about you? Where do you see this heading? Where do, where do we have to, to move forward with this? Well, I think we could look at the education level first, since we're talking about education on this podcast. Um, if you look at CAPTI, the Commission Accreditation of Physical Therapy Education Programs, and you look in their requirements, if you kind of scroll down to 7D in that form, you will definitely see the word nutrition, cognitive, psychosocial factors, really all the precepts that Ginger mentioned with regard to integrative and lifestyle medicine are in our CAPTI requirements, which means they're going to show up in our program. And they've been there for a while already, but we're going to see more of it just because there's so much of a focus on health behavior change, especially in the realm of kind of the psychological and behavioral interventions that are needed. So yes, we're going to see, we're going to continue to see our education change and shift in this direction. Then with that, as Ginger mentioned, then people will start to change um, their practice. And many of us have already done that because we've kind of seen the writing on the wall, but I think there are opportunities or, and there are opportunities for physical therapists to start to interact with um, corporations who are looking for people to solve their really financial problems because chronic health conditions really are bleeding the bottom line in some of those companies. And when you look at our broad scope of practice as professionals, we really fit well into addressing those concerns where other professionals maybe, they may have a little bit more expertise in maybe one area, but our broad scope practice with the integrative and lifestyle medicine component to it helps solve a lot of those problems for individuals as well as the businesses out there that are looking for solutions. Yeah, I love how this kind of ties into population health a little bit. And, and I think that's an area that physical therapists are primed uh, to, to make an impact in in the future. Uh, so I'd love to see us working as like advisors to corporations or, you know, uh, and trying to fight the zombie workforce, so to speak, you know, and sh showing larger corporations how to get their employees living well, eating right, you know, exercising, doing the right things to optimize their their work life balance or life work balance or flow. It's never really going to be a balance per se, but you know, the the best of what we can and really getting the best out of people and optimizing their lifestyle. Um, so I love that. I love that take on it. I have another question regarding, uh, you know, if there was somebody looking to get into this, the integrative uh, and lifestyle medicine, if there was somebody looking to either start up a business or integrate it into a business, what's one big takeaway message that you would give them for those just getting started? Well, we, we do have a chapter on it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. That's in the new text because, you know, one of the big reasons that we, we felt pretty strongly about getting this information out um, in a textbook form is because I personally, and I, I believe Joe feels the same. So I'll, I'll just, I'll say, you know, I'll speak for both of us here. <laughs> That's all right. I think that we both felt strongly that we didn't want future physical therapists to come out of PT school and feel like they have to chase down five certifications to be qualified, right? To do what we is already within our scope to do. Um, I think that does a great disservice to our degree and to our training and our education. And so one of the reasons um, for getting the book out there is to provide just kind of foundations and a baseline for how to launch your business, you know, if you want to include and embrace integrative and lifestyle medicine. Because though it's in our professional scope, all of the position statements, Joe and I have worked personally on getting some of those position statements passed. While very important, it doesn't mean that it's within everyone's personal scope of practice. And so that's where they have to, we, you know, we have the educational level to make that judgment call to say, you know, I think, I think I need more training in stress management, or I think I need more training in, you know, nutrition or some kind of integrative um, therapy. Um, we just didn't want it to be where PTs would graduate and go, oh, well, now I've got to chase down 20,000 more dollars worth of certifications. I want future PTs to graduate with that, that degree, to become a PT and feel good about moving forward, integrating this. And now for a quick shout out to our newest sponsor, Varela Financial. If you're a physical therapist and you have student loan debt, you got to talk to these guys. What makes them unique is that they view financial planning like running hurdles on a track. And for PTs, the first hurdle many of us run into is student loan debt. Varela Financial will help you get over that hurdle. They not only take the time to explain to you which plans you individually qualify for and how those plans work, 
but they also take the time to show you what your individual case looks like mapped out within each option. So if you're looking for help on your student loan debt or any area of personal finances, we recommend working with them. I use Varela Financial personally, and they were able to help me lower my student loan repayment from about $1,800 a month down to about $135 per month simply by finding the right repayment plan that best fit me, my family, and our life goals. You can check them out at varelafinancial.com. Link is in the show notes if you need it for reference and tell them the HET podcast crew sent you. And now back to the show. Yeah, I love that. I think, uh, you know, I, I don't teach the wellness course in our, our university, but I am promoting the book for that course. So we're going through some revamping now. So I'm hoping that that'll happen. I think it will. But let's talk about the book a little bit here. Tell us a little bit about the process that you use to pull in basically every all-star in the world of physical therapy that I can imagine. I, we don't have enough time and I don't have enough breath to say all these names, but just a few off the top here. Uh, Rupal Patel, Carla Bell, Janet Besner, uh, Eric Chaconis, Karen Litzy, Don Magnuson, Todd Davenport, uh, Nicole Stout, uh, the two of you, it just the list goes on and on, right? Lisa Van Hoos, uh, Alex Ortiz. I mean, there's just, there's so many people here that I personally look up to and I go to for when I have questions about their area of specialty. How did you get this group together? How did you come up with the idea to like put all this in one, one place and really say, hey, this is, this is going to be the resource and, and here it is. Tell us a little bit about the process. Um, a lot of elbow grease involved in that process. Yeah, I, I can only imagine. <laughs> and it was during COVID. <laughs> so I'll tell you the, you know, it's funny. So Ginger had the idea for this book and she came to me and said, you know, all the pieces are there basically, but we really don't have a resource. Um, luckily we now have that resource. And as you mentioned, um, Scott, a lot of DPT programs are using the book really in the health and wellness promotion, some of them in, in primary care um, based topics, but we didn't have a resource. So we started out, we started reaching out to people and we were getting good responses. And as you mentioned, like there are key people around key topics like Stephen George's psychologically informed care, um, Janet Besner, who really wrote some of the earliest research on health and wellness promotion for our profession. So we wanted to bring those key people in and COVID hit at this time. So all these people, all these, most of these are educators or very busy clinicians, or they're both. And they're trying to figure out how do I negotiate COVID? How do I bring a DPT program online? How do I manage all these things? But at the same time, there was also um, this feeling that since this disease is so linked to chronic health conditions, right? The people who are suffering the most are those with chronic health conditions. And yes, we need vaccines, but we need to prevent this, that there was also this feeling of like, this book is so timely that everyone wanted to be a part of it. And, and Ginger and I are, are so th thankful to everyone who joined during this kind of stressful time, but it in many ways was perfect timing because we had the research to fall back on, but we also had this really current pandemic, if you will, that made the project really important to everyone. Yeah, especially I'm thinking also to to add to the list of things that people had on their plate, all the parents out there that had, I know I have three kids, and then all of a sudden you're supposed to homeschool them while doing this extra project and doing your work. Um, you needed all the integrative and lifestyle medicine that you could get. <laughs> yeah, that's no joke. I, I, you know, my wife's a stay-at-home mom, um, which is a blessing, right? And I teach from home a lot of the time, which uh, is a blessing and a curse at times. But when COVID hit and we had to homeschool, neither one of us, despite being a college educator, was ready for fourth and fifth grade math and science and social studies and all the things. And I was just like, oh, man, we got to go back to this again. Huh? OK. So, yeah, it was not awesome. It was not easy. Uh, my daughter suffered tremendously. I saw the difference. Uh, in online schooling versus in-person schooling. She's definitely a social butterfly. She needs that interaction. She needs to be around people. So the social aspect was huge for her uh, and that that really suffered, right? So again, for us, the the key was was trying to integrate a lot of this stuff that, you know, you guys talk about and it was just survival mode for a lot of it, you know? So I think, you know, having a baseline and a foundation and something you can turn to and at least educate people on uh, just for life in general, right? Not even not even for, for the health issues is, is a great thing to have. So again, I can't thank you guys enough for, for 
doing this and coming up with this book and, and, you know, really showing people the, the opportunities that are out there. And I think it's going to be, like you said, uh, uh, just a, a really prime opportunity for physical therapists down the road to start integrating as much of this stuff as, as possible. And I the think, other, go ahead, Jim. The other, the other fun aspect about, you know, kind of Ginger and I bringing these people together is that there are physical therapy professionals out there who are doing some really interesting work that no one hears about. So we're able to give them, you know, an additional voice and platform in the profession for that. For example, um, and I'm going to leave names out because we have over 40 people who contributed. So it's hard for me to remember everyone, but Jeremy Fletcher um, contributed to the book on mental health and physical therapy, which is a fast growing um, part of what we do, realizing that all the lifestyle interventions have a positive impact on mental health. There's another chapter on addiction which we don't talk about so much in physical therapy, but knowing that we're involved in mitigating, you know, opioids, the opioid crisis, again, like we kind of brought in, you know, the things you would expect like nutrition, exercise, stress reduction, but it's also like, okay, how do we the, bring the environmental lifestyle? piece, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Too. Things that we really should be talking about that um, we're not talking about enough, basically. Yeah. And I think, you know, having, those hard conversations after COVID, I think now it just becomes that much easier because it's like, hey, look, we, we've seen pretty bad. Let's start addressing the things that we really need to in case pretty bad comes back again. You know, let's let's think of, you know, all the things we can address to make things less bad in the future. So like you said, right place, right time. You know, people heard the calling. You, you just kind of had to round up the troops and, and get it done. You know, that's awesome. And it continues. We, you know, we look at post-COVID now. Just like we looked at post polio, where it may be that some of these populations of people who are infected with COVID now have, you know, somewhat of a chronic disease. And these integrative and lifestyle interventions work very well to mitigate those long term symptoms and progression. So true. Well, guys, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and for just sharing your wealth of knowledge and your, your work. Um, you know, I hope that uh, more people will take this and run with it. And those that are skeptical will come over to, to this side and kind of see the light a little bit. Um, but we ask all of our guests one final question. And that question is, if you could change one aspect of higher education, whether it be DPT or otherwise, what aspect would you change and how would you change it? So Ginger and I talk about this a lot. So this is on our, our minds constantly. There's a lot of different ways to approach this. But if you're talking, so you're asking me about the DPT program, particularly any, like, any form of higher education. Yep. Yeah. It could be DPT, but and PTA. Yeah. yeah. I really think we have to, so I'm going to talk just because I'm a physical therapist and I know the three of us are PTs. I think within the educational system of physical therapists and physical therapist assistants, we have to do better at empowering those professionals with the idea that they can serve at the top of their scope of practice as primary care providers. And our whole profession needs to rapidly move in that direction. And it fits well with almost every chronic and in some way acute conditions that we see in the general healthcare system. It's, it's safe. The care we provide is safe. It's effective and it's efficient. It's funny that you mentioned that, Joe, because we actually have a bit of legislature in Texas right now that's going through that because we're not considered primary care practitioners, we can get billed at a higher copay than going to see your primary care doc. And it doesn't say that we are a primary care practitioner. It's just because we're not, we, we have a higher copay that's untapped. There's no limit to it. So people can have copays to go up to physical therapy for $300, $400, $500. It's mm -hmm. insane. So, so my, yeah. my, I'll just say one more thing, um, really what you're talking about and, and Ginger and I are talking more about this as well, that in some way, because we don't have the exact, um, policy around who we are and how effective we can be as, as professionals, that we run the risk of being marginalized within the healthcare, within the healthcare system as professionals. And I think your example right there, what, what's happening there is insurance companies using that as a way to limit access to safe, non-pharmacologic physical therapy care. Yeah, it's yeah. just ridiculous. Now you've just hit on, you just hit on my favorite nerve, policy and advocacy. Do we have Take another away. half an hour? Yeah, go for it. Um, we have the same problem in North Carolina. We, um, I'm, 
our ABTA North Carolina uh, legislative chair. I have a f- one or two or ten, you know, things to say on that because I'm constantly giving lectures in our DPT and PTA programs. And one of the things I think should change, and that's why I'm inside of our DPT and PTA programs in North Carolina, to give these specific lectures on advocacy, to walk the students through step by step, to say, legislators are not scary people. They're real people. And in North Carolina, they work for $14,000 a year in what is a full-time job with a part-time label. It is a I don't even know how they do the job. I have mad respect for our legislators in North Carolina. But in order to have, you know, if, we, if we're not, if we don't have a seat at the table, we're on the menu. And so we are already in many ways marginalized. We don't have a seat at the table. And to change that by educating students that, you know, at a bare minimum, if we want to make a difference, we need to actually have a strong membership organization. And that we know is a current, is a current problem. So Advocacy can start with just being a member of APTA and giving that money so that we have, people don't like the word, but this is what it comes down to, the lobbying power to have a seat at the table. Our eyes and ears are the lobbyists in the the legislatures. And if we don't have those, we have no eyes and ears. And so bills get passed. And a lot of this, most of it happens at the state level. A lot of things get passed without us even knowing they're being passed. So we are left out of the conversation when if we would have just been able to call that legislator and said, hey, this is what I do. And by the way, we're primary care providers. We shouldn't be grouped into the specialist category where my patient now has a $95 copay and it's cheaper for her to be for her to come to me as a cash based practitioner, which is why I went cash based in 2004 because of these ridiculous copays we've been stuck with. So I think that if we do a better job with advocacy and accessibility to being a member of APTA, if we do a better job with incorporating this into that, which maybe just starts with, you know, us doing our job and and talking to students and, and doing guest lectures and things like that and encouraging them to say, hey, you have a voice and you can make a difference. Know who your representatives are. Call them up. Leave a message. If they hear from you half a dozen times, then when you're your chapter, you know, of APTA has to go for an ask. We're going to be fighting on many issues coming up soon in North Carolina. When you have a big ask, um, if you go ask a stranger for a favor, how often, how likely is it that that stranger is going to do you a favor? They're just not. Yeah. If you have a relationship with them, they'll go, oh yeah, that, that's Ginger from down the way. She owns a private practice. She really cares. I'm, yeah. I, let me talk to her and see what she's got to say. So I think that um, at a bare minimum, if we could empower the next generation to to know that their voice matters and that they yep. can be advocates with just a minimal effort, we will yep. change what we can do in yep. the next generation. Well, and Ginger, I can attest to that because I've often said that I'm more of a behind the mic, get the spotlight on these people, you know, kind of advocate. I'm not the go up to Washington or D.C. or your state capitol and shake hands and kiss babies, right? I'm not that guy. But that being said, with all that we have going on in Texas, uh, I found it important to go to Texas Legislative Day this year, uh, which only happens every two years because they only meet every two years in Texas, which is in Spain for such a large state. But I digress. And I went up there and I did the thing and I went and I met with our rep and it, they're not scary people. They're good people. They're they're here to learn about what we have to say. And, you know, it's a simple message. It's a two minute out elevator pitch. You go in, you tell them what we're here to represent, what we'd like them to co-sign on and you're in and out. They're very thankful and it brings awareness, you know, at the very least. And the way that uh, Texas runs it, one PT usually goes with two or three students. So, you know, we're, we're working on that next generation. And again, I'm trying to lead by example and show my students, hey, if it's important enough for me to go up there and do it, trust me, guys, it's important. Get up there, wear the shirt and tie, you know, dress up, shake hands, kiss babies, whatever you got to do. Advocacy is worth it. And and it's if you're not doing it, it's going to be a point where, like you said, things are going to get voted on that we didn't even know. And it's too late at that point. Now you got to spend all the time going backwards to fight it instead of moving right. forward and trying to be proactive about things we want and need. That's right. Absolutely. Which can take years. We yeah. We got It took us a very long time, over a decade, to reverse a spinal manipulation bill because just by simple wording. Um, It's not that someone even has a malicious intent. It's just that if you don't get the wording right, you get left out. Well, shoot, an Oxford comma 
group dust together with speech language uh, pathology at one point on a bill, right? So like, come on, you know, like. Yeah. yeah. Ginger and I have said a number of times that we really need to have some kind of unified voice in the profession that, you know, is obviously at APTA National, which is in DC and something that every state can kind of just pick up on. And now we have one unified profession that is now pushing a similar theme through, let's say, in the legislature in their state. Because as you know, we live in the United States and each state has their own laws, but we should do, a, we should really be mindful about trying to have similar, similar laws or the exact same law passed in every state so that we don't have a um, disjointed profession that really wouldn't benefit us. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, until we get unfettered direct access in all 50 states, that that one's not done. And that's just speaking from personal Texas issues we're going through. Uh, we're one of the most limited in direct access. And that's, again, ridiculous to me. But, yeah, you know, it's crazy because we've had direct access in North Carolina since 1986. Uh, yeah. Lucky. So lucky. I don't know why I left. <laughs> Well, well, guys, thank you again so much for coming on and for taking your time to talk about these things. Uh, where can people reach out to you and, and follow up if they have questions or just want to see what you guys are up to and, and, and grab the book? Sure. Uh, to grab the book, go to optp.com. It's also on Amazon. Uh, if you'd like to follow up with any questions or ask me whatever, you can go to integrativelifestylemed.com or check uh, me out on Instagram at Dr. Ginger Garner. And yeah, Joe, definitely check you? out the sure. Definitely check out the book. It's a wonderful resource. Um, if you want to find out more about me, you can go to integrativepainscienceinstitute.com, or you can check me out on any of my social media handles. Uh, Instagram is the best one at Dr. Joe Tata. Awesome. We'll drop those links in the show notes so it's easy for people to find. Guys, thank you so much. Absolute pleasure. Can't wait to catch up with you guys in the future and see what you're up to. Thanks, thank God. So Thanks much. for having us. Yeah. Well. I hope that episode was entertaining as much as it was informational and educational. If you enjoyed this episode or any of our past episodes, we ask you to please subscribe to the podcast and leave us a rating and review. And please share out the episodes to those who you feel may be able to benefit from them. We also urge you to follow us on all social media platforms at HET Podcast and let us know what topics or experts you would like to hear from in future episodes. And just as a reminder, none of the information on today's show should be considered medical advice. It's simply infotainment or edutainment to help educate our audience. For medical advice, we always advise you to reach out to your preferred medical professionals, and we'll see you on the next show.